All right. Hi, everyone. My name is uh, Christian Keller, and I'm the uh, product lead for PyTorch uh, at Meta. I've been working in AI for the better part of the last 10 years, uh, and on PyTorch for almost four years now. So how many of you here have experience with AI and ML directly? Okay. And how many of you have used PyTorch? Thank you. It's always nice to see. So as a quick intro, though, uh, PyTorch um, is a library based on uh, so a Torch library. Um, it was developed by Facebook um, AI Research Labs and is now actually part of the foundation. So it's not hosted in Facebook anymore or Meta. It's hosted as part of its own independent uh, foundation or part of the Linux Foundation. It was released in 2016. And it's a programming interface for building and training neural networks. Uh, today, PyTorch is the most used uh, framework in AI and ML. And we're looking at it here from the perspective of research. And it doesn't go all the way back to 2016. But uh, over two thirds of research papers uh, in AI are built uh, are using PyTorch. So why is it so uh, popular? And what made it so popular? Um, it's simple and intuitive. Um, that's one of our key principles here. Uh, the low-level details are abstracted away, although you do still have some ability to, to tweak um, most of the things you want for research. And it's a Python API wrapper around C++, C++ kernels for speed. At the core also of PyTorch um, product design is that um, we made eager mode the center of PyTorch. Uh, other frameworks. We're focusing on performance and other elements, and so took a different approach. But for us, eager mode was important. And so what does it mean, eager mode? It means that the code is run in the way you write it. And so it's executed in the order you've been writing it. It allows for dynamic control flow and interactive experimentation and debugging. So it's easier for complex model. You know when an error pops up, where it's coming from, based on where you've written your code. But that was a risky bet, again, because performance um, for many was, um, was what mattered most. And so eager mode is considered slow. We're not optimizing things. We're just running it the way, the way you've written it. But this flexibility came so at the cost of interpreter overheads that were initially hidden behind the GPU. But this is starting to, to disappear now, because GPUs are getting more and more performant. So that's what took us to number one, but what is going to keep us there? We want to be fast now. And so what I'm going to talk about today is what's our approach and how we think about getting that speed and still maintaining the PyTorchiness, in a way, for your deployments. So can we build a user-first compiler? We're looking at here these two uh, dimensions, performance and ease of use. It's not the only two dimensions that matter here, but I think these are the ones that we constantly struggle with. How many optimizations we want to bring and at what cost for the user when it comes to simplicity and when it comes to, um, to debuggability. So we're trying to have both. Uh, so how's, this is how we're going to look at it. It's with torch.compile. And so that's what we branded as PyTorch 2.0 that we announced at our last conference uh, in December. And this torch.compile, which is a very simple um, line of code that you can add, can create massive performance improvements for uh, your models, both in training and in inferencing. So what does a deep learning compiler do? There's three main steps that we're looking at here. First is the graph acquisition. It's looking at the code that you have and being able to translate that into a graph, understanding the various loops, the various um, uh, changes that you make in your code. There's the graph lowering, which involves taking all the operators that you might have started with, which could be over 2,000 or more different operators, and simplifying that into a subset that's manageable and that can be used after that for optimizations. And then there's the graph compilation, looking at these operators that have been simplified and trying to combine them in a way that can create gains uh, for speed. 
And so <clears throat> the, the numbers are not exact that I'll share with you here, but roughly you can have between two to 3,000 types of operators that exist initially before the, um, at the graph acquisition step. The growth, graph lowering will bring it down to between two and 300 uh, different operators that we then combine in a way um, to create these optimizations. So the graph acquisition is capturing a static graph representing the program. So that's important because unlike a Python uh, code that you write that can be quite dynamic in a way, like when we're creating these optimizations, we need to see something that's static that can be run and optimized. The growth flooring, uh, graph flooring I talked about and the compilation, um, that's device specific optimized code. So the device specific part is important here. Um, and oftentimes we think of um, deployments on the server. And so you have, let's just say, NVIDIA or AMD GPUs and you want to deploy there and you have one specific type of hardware you want to optimize for. So that's great, but it, that also applies for the case of Edge where you don't necessarily control the hardware that you have. And each device will have a specific CPU, GPU, or, uh, or NPU even that can be leveraged. And so how do you create um, compilations in a way that, that can be targeted at these devices or these type of hardware? So we're only beginning our compiler journey here. We started uh, back, uh, our step one was uh, JIT trace, which is about capturing the graph. That created, um, yeah, that allowed to run models on certain inputs, um, record the traces, so for all the executed operation into the graph, and it was only correct if the function is independent of the data it operates on. And that's a little tricky because in effect, like the model that you wrote um, would only work for a certain space of inputs that would have been defined ahead of time. And so that's limiting because sometimes, um, when you deploy on large scales for billions of users at times, the, they don't necessarily fit into uh, the limitations that you set for the input. So the model could behave um, in an unpredictable way. So we decided to do better. We decided to do JIT.script. And so that's when we introduced TorchScript. TorchScript um, is a statically typed subset of Python. It did allow for more of that uh, PyTorchiness to be brought in a way uh, all the way down to the deployment. Um, <clears throat> and one important point here is that the source code um, needed to be refactored, and so you couldn't include with it any third-party libraries. So that's a problem when you have, um, uh, when you're bringing libraries like, I don't know, NumPy, for example, or any of the other ones that you might have wanted to have, they need to be taken out or rewritten as part of the code all the way in it. So we had JIT.trace, JIT.script, and now we've got Dynamo. So how is Dynamo different? So we include graph breaks for completeness to revert to eager mode. And we've got guards for soundness to ensure that all the assumptions are still valid and that in a sense, no matter the inputs that you get, the model will behave in the way you had predicted. So the idea behind it is that instead of trying to get you one graph for your entire model, you create a set of subgraphs that we know we can compile that are gonna be static. And around these subgraphs, we're able to identify areas that are gonna be Python code that still allow for the dynamism that um, that PyTorch allows. So are we done? Almost. So we talked about Dynamo, and so that does everything I just talked about until now. AOT Autograd here captures the graph for backward ops, so if you want to do training in particular, that's going to be important, and it's a similar process. And Torch Inductor here is here to lower the device to optimize. I'll talk a little bit about inductor in a minute, but what's important here is that there's multiple entry points depending on where you want to go. And you can use this whole stack all the way through inductor to the devices uh, to optimize it. We have GPU, CPU, for example, and we've got some um, benchmarks I'll share in a minute on the GPU side. 
But you could connect, like if you're a hardware manufacturer or a computer API, even at the Dynamo level or at the AOT Autograd level, depending on what you're trying to achieve here. So the inductor optimizes the code for performance by fusing operators. So this is what we're looking at in terms of identifying operators that would work well together in order to optimize for the um, device you're targeting. And then um, you can register custom backends through Inductor. And so here the idea is that we want to leverage the community to be able to build and tie into what we're building. So we're not going to be the specialist at building um, optimizer for, let's say, um, AMD GPUs or for NVIDIA GPUs or for um, Qualcomm chips maybe. And so being able to have these vendors or these compute APIs that arrive tie in at this level and create the optimizations they need is what we're hoping to achieve long term. So this um, new uh, process, the dot .compile, just adding this one line of code gets you 43% performance improvements over eager mode on NVIDIA GPUs in these benchmarks. For a set of models you can find, um, it's about 120 models that we've trained, that we've looked at from Hugging Face to Tim to uh, Torchbench that we can find uh, on, our, on our website. And that's just out of the box with one extra line of code that you're getting that. And it works 93% of the time. So one, um, thing, as I mentioned earlier, is we're an open source project. We work not just with the team that's at Meta or that's at Amazon or at Microsoft or at Google or any of these other companies that works on, on PyTorch, but um, through the many contributors that, that come and, and engage with us day to day. We've got over like 3,000 contributors that uh, are part of building PyTorch. And so um, you can find here, and I'll, these slides will be shared later, but on our website, where to contribute. An easy way to start contributing on PyTorch um, is initially, if you're learning about it, through improving documentation that we have. So we've got a docathon starting um, late May. You can scan the uh, QR code if you'd like to join. And <clears throat> there are more resources you can find. We've got um, the conference that we had in December that have uh, Sumith's keynotes. Sumith is the, uh, one of the creators of, of PyTorch, and he describes the Dynamo in the 2.0 that I just talked about, as well as these developer notes. <coughs> and you can follow us on all the various social networks and contribute on GitHub. And that's it. Thank you. I'll take a few questions if there's any. So the uh, torch chip and the inductor, um, how, how would a company go about contributing one of those back in, like your hardware system? Yeah. Um, so I think uh, the first thing to do if you haven't been engaging with us is uh, to get in touch with the, um, the team that's working on that. And so uh, you can find them on our. Um, yeah, and so on that page on contributing, there's like specific entry points for, for that. The, um, the other piece is uh, looking at our GitHub um, for PyTorch. That has all the documentation you need to kind of get it get started. And there's tutorials also on how to, um, to engage on the, on the inductor piece specifically. Yeah. Okay, if you have another question, I got a mic here. Uh, one more thing, if you want to learn more about the inductor, there's also a video you can find uh, online from our conference by um, uh, an engineer called Enzel. And he, um, he describes, in a way, how inductor works in more details with the use of Triton underneath. Um, that was a, a, an open source uh, language that was promoted by OpenAI initially. And so, yeah. That was so clear. Yeah. No other question. <laughs> I'd just like to say uh, it was interesting listening to you talk about AI. It's something that uh, it's on all of our minds nowadays. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you. 
Well, and uh, all the models you're hearing about these days, um, ChatGPT, DALI, uh, all these are built on PyTorch. So we're pretty proud of this. Um, and uh, so keep, keep an ear out for, for what's happening out there. And, uh, and feel free to reach out if you have any questions. Thank you.